Greetings from my TMAI home office in Dallas, Texas. We're continuing our series, Pictures of Hope, God's Grace in Unusual Times. Did you know that trained TMEI students, professors, graduates, and pastors are shepherding people in over 75 nations with exposit expository preaching of God's word? Would you help us spread the good news, the gospel of hope? If our series, Pictures of Hope, God's Grace in Unusual Times, encourages you, please be sure to post it on social media and forward it through email or text messages. So last week, during my Zoom home fellowship group with Countryside Bible Church, we studied Psalm 86. Uh, I was so impassioned by that psalm that I went ahead and wrote a four-page devotional, and our leadership team thought it would be good to make it into a mini-sermon. So please pick up your version, your copy of God's Word, as we study Psalm 86, and I've entitled this message, Seeing God's Majesty Through a Lethal Virus. Perhaps you or people you know are struggling with the far-reaching effects of coronavirus. The last couple of months have produced extreme emotions for many of us. For me, it's difficult to process that healthy people yesterday, well, they're in eternity today. Millions have filed for unemployment, savings and retirement accounts showing great promise of swiftly drained like water is from a child's bathtub? What on earth just happened? How are we supposed to process the hurt and the heartache? Many are asking, where is God? Is he listening to my cries? How is it possible to see God's majesty through this kind of pain? Well, I want you to picture King David as with tears flowing down his cheeks, lungs gasping for air, quivering hand scratching ink to paper at the direction of the Holy Spirit, he composes Psalm 86. You can also almost see him agonizing over what appears to be insurmountable grief. In our Psalm, David uses the words I, me, and my at least 24 times. He prayed for himself. Why was David so distraught? Verse 14, violent men sought to kill him. So in tearful agony, David longed for God's mercy. Out of desperation, he summoned the Lord with 14 petitions. I want you to know that 13 of those are imperatives. It's, a, it's an indication of what God must do if he was to survive. The reason for his pleading is discovered nine times with the words for and because. Take out your pen or your highlighter and find those words for and because, because these are telling. It tells us the reason. You see, David, David reveals why godly saints approach the Lord for mercy and for comfort and for deliverance. He shows us how to cope with misery. His pleadings encourage us, encourages us to cry out to the Lord. Here's why. You see, God alone is the sole source of his rescue of his joy and of his strength? So let me ask you, has life ever been so difficult to the extreme so that all you can do is fret, worry, or weep? Perhaps you're like David. You cry out to God for answers. You'll do just about anything for your circumstances and pain to subside, if only for an hour. If this is you, press the pause button. Just, just stop and think through this psalm for a moment. Realize that God listens to the redeemed because, it's in the text, because he's good and gracious and filled with relentless loving kindness. Notice that Psalm 86 provides really four steps to seeing God's majesty amid affliction. First, he has a plea for mercy in verses 1 through 7. Second, recognize God's glory, verses 8 through 10. Third, Receive comfort through submission, verses 11 through 13. And fourth, plea for God's mercy once again. And we see that in verses 14 through 17. So in the first verse, David invited Almighty God to stretch forth his listening ear towards his lips. We see that also in Psalm 71, 2, Psalm 78, 1, and Psalm 88, 2. David was accustomed to asking God to lean forward to hear him. He respectfully implored God, answer me because I'm afflicted and needy. I want you to notice what David didn't do in this psalm. 
In this psalm, he didn't address his pain and his sorrows and his depression to men and women. No, he went directly to God's throne, and so must you. The king understood that the only way he makes that alive is if God saves him. So if I could, let me just summarize David's rationale. God, if you don't rescue me, I'm going to die. You are my only hope. Would you like to pray like David? Look, if, if you want to talk to God like David, you have to immerse yourself in the Bible. Then you can approach the Lord with bold confidence in his goodness. David used the word, I want you to notice verse 3, he used the word Lord in verse 3 seven times in this psalm. The Hebrew word also means master. It's David's recognition of God's sovereignty. You see, David saw himself as God's slave in verse 4, and, and so he appealed to his master. This is the king's admission that God has complete control over his life and that he alone can put a stop to his afflictions. As always, our master is ready to forgive those who mourn over their sins in verse 5. Learn from David. He doesn't want his sin to stand in the way of God's grace, and so he appeals to his goodness. He, he reaches out to his readiness to forgive and to the Lord's unrelenting, steadfast love. We know from Romans 8, 31 through 39, that God never abandons a repentant sinner. David was a godly man. It's, it's, it's God who said that he was a man after his own heart because he was humble. He sought forgiveness and to do God's will. We see that in Acts 13, 22, a thousand years after David's life. You see, there was no one else in David's life or in your life, in my life, who can soothe a troubled heart like God. He answers the repentant because he's good. His loving kindness is abundant and he's ready to forgive. David suggests a second step to seeing God's majesty through affliction. It's by recognizing his glory in verses 8 through 10. He prayed to God because there's no one like him, verse 8. I love it here. The, the, the Hebrew phrase for there is no one, it, it literally means non-existence. You see, God is the only God. Other gods don't exist. David addressed the one and only God, saying that no one can do what he does. You see, only God creates everything from nothing. Only God, through the second member of the Trinity, became man and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, John 1. Only God causes the person dead in sin to become righteous through Christ Jesus, Romans 5, 17 through 21, and Ephesians 2. When you're faced with difficulty, recognize God's glory and have confidence in his love for the lost, Psalm 86, 9. You see, David appealed to the certainty of the Great Commission, which is God's eternal plan to save individuals from all nations, Matthew 28, the Great Commission. From the pit of your sorrows, suffering and pain, keep your eyes focused on spending eternity with the redeemed. Here's why because God is great, and he does wondrous deeds. He alone is God, verses 5, 13, and 15, and his steadfast loving kindness is abundant. Does knowing God's eternal plan of redemption from the Great Commission help you to pray with confidence? Seeing God's majesty in affliction provides comfort through submission, which is the third step in Ephesians, excuse me, in in Psalm 86, 11 through 13. You see, David implored God to teach him his way. He wanted his behavior aligned with God's truth and a heart that feared his name, verse 11. This is how the redeemed pray. You know, apart from the Bible, how would you know to walk in the truth? That's what Psalm 119 is all about. That's what 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 is all about. Without the proclamation of God's word, people are lost. And without guidance, they're abandoned to the eternal results of their sin. John 3, 36, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So in verse 11, 
the king implores, the king begs us to unite his heart to fear, meaning honor and respect his name. Do you long to embrace everything that's true of God? You know, if you're not reading God's word, scratch that. If, you, if you're not consuming God's word, it's impossible to submit to him. So don't study the Bible. If you don't study the Bible, you won't be comforted through your struggles. Well, there's a final step to seeing God's majesty through affliction. And it's to repeat the first step. It's to plea for mercy again, just like David in verses 14 through 17. Way back in verse 1, David implored God to answer his prayer. God must respond to David because he was afflicted and needy. You who have the gifts of compassion and mercy want to know the source of David's misery. It's like you want to come alongside him. Here it is. Terrorists pursued him. They wanted him dead. Verse 14. And at the time he wrote Psalm 86, we can't determine which men were trying to kill David. King Saul's attempts to take him out failed several times. The Philistines hated him and wanted him dead. You know what? Even Absalom, his own son, tried to murder him. With foreign nation, excuse me, with foreign nations, his king and even his own son all taking every opportunity to kill him, what was the source of David's unyielding confidence? It's in verse 8. There is no one like God. The wicked, the sneering, those wicked sneering at him with daggers and spears in hand were no match for the Lord. Unlike David, they didn't set themselves before the Lord, Psalm 86, 14. So let me ask, why do violent people destroy God's elect? Why would one person desire to kill another? Here's the answer. It's from David. Because they refuse God's presence in their lives. This is the way it's always been for the redeemed. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 3.12 that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That is why in Psalm 86.15, the king's plea for mercy started with the recognition of who God truly is. Look at verse 15. He is Lord. He's merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, and plentiful in truth. Do you know God well enough to pray confidently like David? David knew God. You know, if he was to survive in verses 16 through 17, then God must respond to his cries. Here they are. Turn to me, exclamation point. Be gracious to me exclamation point. Grant me strength. Grant strength to your slave, even the son of your slave, another exclamation point. And show me a sign for good. How did God answer David's prayer? Well, he helped him and he comforted him in verse 17. God overcame David's horrific circumstances by putting his glory on display for the whole world to see. Psalm 86 guides you to recognize God's majesty through afflictions like the coronavirus. So be still, be comforted, have confidence. It's here in God's word, the Bible, that, that God teaches you to boldly depend on him through hardship. So are you asking God for clarity about your trials, your troubles, your afflictions, your illnesses, perhaps? David's country his enemy, his enemy is plural, and even his son wanted him dead. I can't even begin to imagine his desperation, but, but perhaps your hardship gives you a glimpse of his agony. For you who are depending on your so-called righteousness, you who have not turned from sin and have not trusted Jesus and his righteousness, you who haven't depended on Christ as your Lord and Savior, now's the time to do so. Come to Christ, humbled and broken over your sin, and you will see God's majesty through your affliction for his glory and for your peace. Thank you. <laughs>